Hi, it's Mike again with Ubtastic. Today I'm sitting down with Daniel X. O'Neill. Uh, well, you might know him as a poet and a playwright, and, uh, um, and a little bit of his work that he's done with the uh, open governments and, you know, a few little things. Uh, he's, right now he's the uh, executive director of the Smart Chicago Collaborative mm -hmm. and um, also has been to the White House as a champion of change for the work he's done with uh, open government. Uh, Dana, thanks for taking the time to sit down. All right, good to see you, Mike. So, uh, how does how does a poet and an artist go to become the man in the shirt, in the in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the in the the suit? That's like that Sprint commercial. <laughs> We're gonna stick it to the man. Yeah, yeah. But you are the man, <laughs> so I'm sticking it to myself. <laughs> um, right. So I've been sticking it to myself for a while. Uh, how did I go from being uh, a poet and a playwright to? Uh, where I am now. I guess I don't see it as crazy and circuitous of a path as it seems. Um, in the you know late 80s and early 90s, I was a part of the spoken word poetry scene in Chicago and around the country. I did a lot of tours and, and I wrote books and um, uh, you know my mission, uh, my completely um, silly mission was to become the worldwide entertainment juggernaut of the 21st century. Uh, in the That's idea, Juggernaut Co. <laughs> juggernaut Co. is my handle uh, in a lot of different places, although it's too difficult to spell, right. so I've moved to and your, your, I mean, your, your degree was uh, English and Anthropology. How do you go from being uh, very much creative and, and, and expressive to what is now focus on technology? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I did get a degree in English and Anthropology from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And again, I don't see it as that wild of a path. Mm -hmm. um, anthropology is, the f is, you know, focus on the study of man, the study of human beings, mm -hmm. and why they do things. And I'm, in English, you know, help, certainly helped me as a poet, but it's just anytime you have to communicate with people in any job you do. Right. So um, I don't see it as that goofy. And then also, I do continue it through in a number of ways. I'm really interested in the archaeology of technology and the recent history of technology, and even like the current, you know, uh, uh, sort of explication of why websites or technologies are the way they are. Mm -hmm. Often we'll see... Kind of how did we get here? Yeah, why did we make it that way? Right. There's always a reason. There's always a reason for every feature that's mm -hmm. in every piece of software. And sometimes it can be a very idiosyncratic thing. Uh, right. And well, even if you look at just the, something as simple as the, the style of website design over the last 10 years and how it's morphed and changed, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's, a, I, I presume, a very... Uh, uh, cosmetic level. I think we're in the bootstrap age right now. That's the... Uh, that's oh, the, for websites? Yeah, oh, they're, absolutely. All, they're all bootstrap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're not bootstrap, you're nowhere. Yeah. And again, why? Because it has utility mm -hmm. and because, you know, um, there's so much focus on mobile design and it's such a great um, way to do it. Yeah, we used to be in the age of type pad. Right. That was, you know, you know, in the in the early 2000s, the, the right-hand uh, nav column mm -hmm. was, you know... Every, that was it. You that had was to it. have it. Your site had to have and it. And when Blogger first came out, it was, you know, probably the first time that CSS really got mm -hmm. a huge bump. And then everybody started using CSS, and everything got better. And part of the archaeology of that, I used to be a lurker on the W3C accessibility list mm -hmm. in the late 90s and early 2000s. And it was all very radical accessibility uh, advocates right. who were trying to figure out what standards there could be for um, designing websites that met the needs of mm -hmm. people with disabilities. So they were just trying to figure vision. all this stuff out. Just yeah. And it ended up that the output of that was CSS. They oh. thought they were talking about how to make websites accessible for people with mm -hmm. disabilities. In fact, they were making standards for making better websites, right. period. And also making 3D and shadows and all kinds of stuff that gets yeah. abused like crazy Drop now. caps. And <laughs> um, okay, so you went from from being kind of uh, having a mind that's trying to uh, 
understand why things are the way they are. How did that lead to you getting involved in, in the data front? Like most um, things, it's, uh, it's a, a goofy path. So um, as a writer and graduating with a degree in English and Anthropology, the most natural path would be to be a, a copywriter for ad firms, which would have been uh, death for me because that's a disastrous uh, right. path, at least as far as I'm concerned. No offense. Um, even though I just said something offensive. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but for you, it would <laughs> for me. Some other people find joy. Exactly. Them. Exactly. Maybe. I don't know. Um, so what I did was I became uh, a paralegal when okay. I got out of college. And I spent six years as a litigation paralegal, and I learned a lot about business that okay. way. Because you can learn a lot about, it's like a long internship around how, um, what happens when everything gets all fucked up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and goes to hell because okay. things tend to they can go to hell, and that I've learned that they go to hell when you don't communicate, because I was the person I was the paralegal going through hundreds of thousands of documents, mm -hmm. trying to figure out you know how the personnel matter got completely screwed up and how a person was discriminated against. <laughs> I, when you say uh, they didn't communicate, I just have to wonder: Did it ever feel like when you're watching a movie and you want to say? Why didn't the actor just say exactly. that thing to the other person? And it would have just saved the entire two hours of And then there wouldn't have been any, any drama. Yeah, then there would have been no volcanoes or giant right. robots or anything. Or, or lawsuits of yeah. people messing other people up. So, and I guess the reason is because of, uh, you know, humans are pretty deeply flawed mm -hmm. creatures. So, um... Uh, I did that, and then to make more money, I did copywriting on the mm -hmm. side. I did, you know, marketing brochure type copywriting. I did a, uh, uh, a brochure for the World Book CD-ROM in 1995, and uh, I think I probably had that. <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> if it came bundled with a Packard Bell, then I had it. Oh, it was a blockbuster <laughs> yeah. uh, thing. You know, click on to Discovery or something yeah. along those lines. And it had um, video. I bet it too. did. Yeah. It did, and that was the first time I did anything. I remember back then, it was the age of interactive. Mm -hmm. It was not about websites yeah, um, or the World Wide Web. It was about interactive experiences. So, um, And I ended up just doing a lot of copywriting for marketing firms, design firms, and then I sort of became a project manager for those mm -hmm. things because you end up writing the copy, and then designers can tend to be a little um, flaky, <laughs> kind of focused on the art. Pretty. Yeah. yeah, and then it'd be like, okay, cool, so you're going to print this, right? And I'm like, yeah. oh, no. Yeah. You should find a printer. And then, yeah. <laughs> so I, I started doing, like, uh, you know, management and project management for those kinds of okay. places. And then uh, broke into, just naturally, I mean, 1998-ish, um, just got into the web because that's where, you know, it was an incredibly growing field. So I've been working in the web and technology since since the middle of 1990s. Did you, uh, you didn't get started with like GeoCities or did you go straight to the... Uh... I was not a practitioner, <laughs> I have to say, until maybe about 2001. Because after a couple years of doing the project management, I realized that, you know, really smart programmers and really good designers, they'll snow you. Mm -hmm. You know, when you try to say as a project manager, you're like, listen, can you do this? Can you put this here? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it's, it's possible. Yeah. You can't do that with this technology. So I wanted to find out you know what? What can what, you do? What what I could do? So I started messing around with salon blogs. That was my first blog. Mm -hmm. um, that was the same time that the Julie Julia blog was going on. That ended up being the movie. Okay. Um, I don't recall that one, but yeah, it was uh, this woman Julie who was blogging about doing one recipe every day. Oh, uh, oh the, uh, with the Julia Child. Yes. yes. Julie Julia Project. Okay. And she was one of the blogs on Salon. Okay. And I, I had another blog on Salon called Google Bits that uh, uh, took, what I did was I copy pasted the obituaries, interesting obituaries from the okay. New York Times, <laughs> and then I would do um, uh, links. Okay. Just hyperlink tons of phrases in the obituaries and do research on the person who died. Yeah. And I call that hypertext enjambment, where you, you, know, you take a phrase like mm -hmm. perhaps um, served in, as, as education secretary for President Clinton. Okay. And you take you know, the phrase President Clinton and link it to um, you 
know, some sideways uh, experience. Or, okay. you know, President Nixon and send it to, you know, uh, <laughs> a, uh, a page about his uh, scandals or something okay. along those lines. So you have sort of editorial um, uh, content in the links. So the VH1 bubbles before they were bubbles. <laughs> yes. Actually, it was after the VH1 bubbles. Oh, okay. But it was exact, it's exactly the same thing. Because I think, and we still, the hyperlink is, is one of the most um, underused uh, tools on the web, especially the title tag. So I would do things, that are, so there's the, word, the phrase itself, mm -hmm. that means something. Then there's the hover, the title tag, right. that can give you different meaning, or it can, mm -hmm. it, it, you it can have a layered, right? Yeah. A layered experience on top of it. And then the actual href, where you go, and a lot of times I would link to Google searches. Okay. So you link to a Google search that is tangential or off yeah. the side. And then it can have a ton of context that is constantly, constantly changing updated. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, yeah, that was the idea of Google Bits. And I had that on salon.com uh, at that time. So that's when I started getting into creating my own content. So you were website. starting to dig in, and you were looking at ways already then of finding new fresh content and pulling it in without having to um, uh, just generate your own content, you could just link to that search, and that was almost like a, a form of data mining. Yeah. Because you were already saying, okay, I'm going to pass this query, and you're going to get these results, and That's exactly it's right. just data. And it changes, mm -hmm. and, you know, the context changes, and... So even two years later, it's still... Based on the user being mm -hmm. logged in or not, yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's poetry. It's, right. it's kind of a... It's a, it's a, live. a form of poetry. Right. Yeah. That's the way I looked at it. So you went from there, and how did you get introduced to pulling data, I mean, how did you go to the next step? So I worked for, for this company called Dunn Solutions Group, mm -hmm. and they uh, they purchased the, the design firm I worked for. I worked for one of the early design firm, web design firms in Chicago mm -hmm. called Streams um, that was started by Dave Skorzik. And so I was a project manager person there, and we did pretty well, and, and Dave sold the company to uh, Dunn Solutions Group. Okay. And it was more of a technical place. They were more into, you know, they were more uh, they want to do like web design and more well, like heavy duty systems. Okay, they were into like you know business intelligence. Okay, so they weren't like a consultant. They were. It was about a hundred person firm that did a lot of business intelligence. And, okay, you know they uh, weren't doing some some company's storefront website. Right, right. timekeeping systems stuff like that. So okay. we were sort of a division uh, that did web design, and then everything went to hell. Because okay. it was, you know, 2001. And people. And everything, yeah, it just, you know, the, the, the web uh, technology world kind of went crazy. Right. And, co and collapsed and, you know, <laughs> the bubble at least did, um, although there was plenty of work. And so I got more involved in more technical projects. Mm -hmm. So I became more astute and more learned about, you know, heavier duty content management mm -hmm. systems, things along those lines. And I was continually frustrated by them because, I mean, at that time, it was like the age of vignette. Vignette was a, a CMS, a content management system, okay. that cost like a million dollars to Was that install. IBM? Vignette? I don't it know. It sounds like an IBM. It. I think it Sweet. probably was. But um, and there were a couple other players mm -hmm. in this space, and it was ludicrous right. that it would cost that much money, and it didn't have that many features. And when I first... Uh, like Radio Userland, that mm -hmm. was what the salon blogs were based on. Radio Userland was the first blog platform that I came in contact oh, okay. with. And it was incredibly powerful. And it had RSS built in, very mm -hmm. early RSS. Um, and the idea of being able to ping and make constant updates mm -hmm. was incredibly appealing. And just the ability to democratize and push down um, the, the ability to publish um, was it really appealing to me. And obviously it was appealing to everybody because this yeah. is the history of the web, right? Yes, and yeah. Blogs, the blogs took off. So well, this is your sliver. This is my own personal realization. And um, so I had, at that time, so it's maybe 2004, 2005, pretty good, it was a pretty good technical project manager to the point where developers couldn't snow me anymore. <laughs> and and, and uh, I could actually be more effective at my job. And... Um, uh, and then learn about these powerful, very low cost tools. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started doing websites on the side by myself okay. for, you know, churches, schools, um, uh, community groups, things like that. Started doing 
community uh, technology training. Mm -hmm. Like I took TypePad. I like doing crazy things that you're not supposed to do with tools, right? right. So TypePad is incredibly powerful because you, for one account for, with $15, you could set up an infinite number of blogs. Right. So I had, you know, juggernautcode.typepad.com and they had domain mapping too. So right. you, could, you could have them at whatever URL you wanted. So I made a website for my church, Queen of Angels Parish in Chicago mm -hmm. and the north side. And then we could have sub blogs for um, uh, different ministries, right? So it's right. like you're into the uh, feeding the homeless or you're into, you know, the, the um, uh, what other ministries, you know, peace and justice. Mm -hmm. And then they could have their own separate. So you could have this whole hierarchy of content under one type ad account. Fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks. Mind blowing. Yeah. It's 2005, right? right? So you could just have an infinite amount of content in a really simple SaaS, you know, content management system mm -hmm. that um, anybody could use. So um, started doing that, and then, you know, we have a, a lot of Spanish-speaking people in the, in the parish, and they were like, wow, this is awesome. Um, of course, they would say it in Spanish. <laughs> um, and, but I don't you know, know how to do this, because I did all this training in English. Right. So I did uh, bilingual computer mm -hmm. training, and, um, and it was just so amazing. you taught yourself Spanish so you could translate? No, I, I just know some Spanish. I'm okay. pretty good with, I'm pretty, uh, you know, I can, I can get along. Pick it up. Um, I used to work in construction with a lot of Mexican drywallers, so I went mm -hmm. to, I got it in high school and then college, and then right after college I, I was able to talk in normal, so I have a, uh, I, I could get along. And we had other Spanish, bilingual Spanish you know, and English speakers at the training. And um, did a lot of other, you know, uh, community-based stuff, like in Rogers Park, did computer training for DevCorp North, which mm -hmm. is the community development organization up there. And, um, and then add to that, around 2005, I was doing stuff for the mayor's office here in Chicago. Okay. And um, started, that was when I first really got into civic data. And the idea was that we were going to take um, uh, basically ChicagoCrime.org, which was created by Adrian Holobody here in okay. Chicago. Okay, yeah, Django. Yeah, who the benevolent dictator for life for Django. <laughs> and I, I, that's an amazing title, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Adrian uh, came up with ChicagoCrime.org, which was just a singular mind-blowing thing because he reverse engineered the Google Maps yeah. um, before there was even an API. And yeah, he would be able to show where crimes were happening. He was able to put dots Was it real-time or some or uh, It was always nine days to Oh, nine days. So nine days real-time. Right? Real-time in terms of when the data was published. Right. Let's put it that way. Okay. So he would, new data get published and it would be out there. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I, just like anybody else on the internet who saw it when he first published it, I was like, whoa, what? Wow, that's, you know, it's Crazy. amazing. Yeah. And then I had um, some uh, work with the city of Chicago at that time, and they were like, you know, we would like to uh, send a, we, had, we do all these 311 service requests, and we get a lot of stuff done. And then we have a list of email addresses for community people. Mm -hmm. And I want to send an email with a PDF attachment of all the 311 service requests that we've completed. And I was like, wow, let me show you the site this one dude did. Yeah. And I said, what if this wasn't crime if it was 311 service requests? It was building permits and restaurant inspections and all the other great things that the city does for people. And what if you never sent an email or never made it, uh, and it was available to everybody and you never sent a PDF? So they bought into it, and then we did a project called ChicagoWorksForYou.com. ChicagoWorksForYou. Yep, ChicagoWorksForYou.com. And uh, to make a long story short, it was kiboshed okay. uh, and never saw the light of day. Oh, really? Yeah. But um, through that, I met Adrian. And then when Adrian got um, the grant to start everyblock.com, uh, which is a uh, local news and community uh, website, mm -hmm. um, I joined him and a couple others as co founder He was the founder, and we had some other co-founders, and I got into open data and the civic data world um, that way. Okay. So... Now, fast forward from there. You've you've created the you've you've helped to create these these tools and and have been involved in the formation of these concepts. Mm -hmm. Open Government Chicago and some of the uh, community groups. Now you're starting to spread out to mm -hmm. get other people involved in how they can contribute to this. Yep. How did that come about? 
So, in my role at Every Block, I was responsible for getting civic data from 16 cities. Mm -hmm. So, cold calling Mayor Michael Bloomberg in New York right. and <laughs> asking him, you know, hey, can I talk to the mayor? Um, uh, you'll be stunned to hear that he was in a meeting. Every yeah. time I call oh, him. yeah, he's um, I was in a meeting. Here, but so. Uh, so, I ended up just talking to people about, you know, our project, which we wanted, you know, like every building permit, every restaurant inspection, every, mm -hmm. every crime report. And they'd end up sending me to whatever goofball in the mayor's office or department mm -hmm. was interested in stuff like that. Okay. And the people they usually transferred me to now are actually some of the leaders of the open government movement. Oh, really? <laughs> in each of the cities. Yeah. So it's kind of funny how it worked so out. Pull them out of the uh, out of the uh, the shadows. They were, you know, just like any good idea. There's always someone else who's thinking about it too. Yeah. So, um, you know. These are people who are fighting the good fight about open data and open government and using new tools to, mm -hmm. to make government more efficient and effective. And sp speaking of using new tools, you have a new project you're getting, you're percolating or you're looking to launch? Yep, so we did launch it. So um, the Civic User Testing Group. Civic User Testing Group. So the CUT Group, the Civic User Testing Group, is a set of regular Chicago residents who get paid to test out Civic apps. Okay. So civic apps. So are they're things. doing the QA and they're providing feedback on the apps. They're saying, "Oh, this crash or doesn't work here." Or what it ends up being a QA um, function, mm -hmm. um, but the idea is that you know we've been pretty successful at public getting the city to publish a lot of data and working directly with them and working directly with the mayor as a candidate and as uh, the mayor mm -hmm. in forming policy that allows for the publication of data and city. The city of Chicago is a great leader um, in this respect, and you know Brett Goldstein, the chief data officer for the city, and John Tolva, the chief technology officer mm -hmm. for the city, and the mayor's office have been just great leaders in this respect. So, um, and then um, you know Open Gov Chicago, uh, you mentioned that Joe Gamuska started that group okay. um, in 2009, and I helped him um, to start it, and. Uh, we, you know, try to focus on developers mm -hmm. and people who are interested in data. Okay. I'm trying to get them interested in, in civic data. And I know you did uh, um, uh, an interview with with um, Paul Baker. With Paul Baker, who who, you know, he hosted a lot of those meetings over right. at Webatex. Um, so um, there's just a lot of people who are already interested in this right. stuff. And Joe just had the idea to, you know, try to organize those people. So. Um, that's been pretty successful, and we have, you know, um, Open Gov Hack Nights mm -hmm. that were started by Derek Gator and Juan pa Pablo Velez. And I mean, there's been a few projects that have come out of those as well. Oh, absolutely. The uh, the Chicago uh, or was it Lobby Data? I can't remember the exact name of the site, but there was uh, Chicago Lobbyist. Uh, Chicago Lobbyist. Yep. Okay, so and that was uh, able to show where uh, lobbying money was going. Correct. So they were able to say, uh, this group donated this amount of money for this cause. Yep. And uh, and uh, Paul kind of described that there was something interesting that it wasn't the data. It wasn't what he expected. Some people thought, oh, it was going to be s the the cigarette groups trying to get uh, you know the smoking ban lifted, and it actually turned out to be trying to build hospitals and things yeah. like that. It was it was interesting to find out that. The government wasn't just spending money on on evil. <laughs> it right. Was, it was actually trying to do something good. Right. And that was. Uh, has there been any surprises for you over the years of looking at data and being like, "Wow, this really changed my perspective on how things are for the better, or for the worse." Well, I think in general, you know, there's a lot of uninformed um, thought around the delivery of services mm -hmm. in the city. Um, that you know, maybe some areas get more services than others. And I've worked in 16 cities now, I've never seen that. Really? And in fact, uh, services are delivered in a really equal way across cities mm -hmm. and across uh, uh, inside cities. That's what I've learned. And um, I, mean, I just have a lot of respect for municipal government um, all over because there's so many uh, uh, city employees that just do really great work. and. Uh, there's nothing, no, none of us sitting on the side in the civic right. hacker industry, <laughs> if you want to yeah. call it that. I do want to call it that, the civic hacking, civic hacking sector, civic innovation mm -hmm. sector of the technology industry. We wouldn't be doing anything. 
if right. it weren't for the hard work of the GIS professionals that actually drew every every polygon in the cities. Right. Um, if you know they didn't uh, publish the street um, uh, uh, sections uh, for every every road, and um, you know we wouldn't be doing anything in what, if it weren't right. for them. Um, and they, you know, they're really unsung heroes of this movement because I think we tend to. Um, give attention to the shiny new thing and the app that came out, but, yeah. you know, um, the thing that comes out in our face right away, not, not all of the infrastructure that went behind it to make it possible. Even something like Plow Tracker, the mm -hmm. city publishes, um, that shows the plows in real time, um, that's really slick and it's fun to watch it, but it's Some important to remember, <laughs> yeah, it's important to remember that um, there's human beings right. who are paid to get into trucks and drive them safely across the city. So that dot that's moving around is a person. It's a human being yeah. who's busting his ass for us. So um, so there's that concept. And then um, I think that uh, what we're trying to do with the civic user testing group mm -hmm. is to inject and build a culture of testing and a culture of collaboration and co-creation with so even if Residence. you're not writing this stuff, you're part of the, the, the possibility of this working and, and sharing this information, even if you're just a person out there with it in your hand using it. You're the most important person in yeah. the world, obviously. Yeah. In any technology company, oh, yeah. any if, system. If nobody's using it, then it's just... It's, it, it's so uh, the motto that we have at, um, at the Cut Group is if it doesn't work for me, it doesn't work. Okay. So um, that's the general concept: is that um, that we need everybody. We need the government to publish data. We need government workers to to do their work. We need developers to care, and we need them to develop high quality software. And I think we've really got that in Chicago, and we're a leader in this space. And everybody deserves a ton of credit. What we need now is true engagement with real residents who help us do our work and help us decide what to make and what will be of use to them to improve their lives and to provide meaningful opportunity to expand the economy here in Chicago and bring, you know, and reduce poverty. Yeah. And, and bring it full circle. That, you know, they, they consume it, they give feedback, and then you're able to make better decisions and then give them new stuff. And then your feedback goes back to the people who are using your, whose services you're using. That's right. And even more that Again, there's a spirit of co-creation. That they say, you know what? You made something. It works really nice. It's completely irrelevant to my life. It'd be right. better if you made this. Right. So, so you can just going all go. the way back to the to the creation process. And also, you, can, process. you do uh, consulting for the government as well, the, the Chicago City. So so that information, you know, helps you get better information. Helps the city make better plans, right. so that way they can deliver. So that's that's actually the real full cycle. Yeah. Right, that, and that's the role that we can play here at the yeah. Smart Chicago Collaborative because we're uh, founded by the City of Chicago, the uh, Chicago Community Trust, and the MacArthur Foundation. Mm -hmm. So I work here at the Trust, and MacArthur provides significant funding, and uh, we get funding from you know on a project basis from all sorts of uh, funders here in Chicago and people who who need to get things done. So we do um, some specific projects for the mayor's office, whether it's hosting the Adopt a Sidewalk program mm -hmm. or uh, coming up with ChicagoEarlyLearning.org that shows where you can find uh, 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 early childhood pre-K uh, locations mm -hmm. and programs. And you know we have a texting function on that. So we're creating uh, open source code that allows us and allows everybody to build on it. Right, there's the... Uh, uh I, I, I forgot about this until you just mentioned that there is the open source um, group here in Chicago. What are the the, the name of the um, people doing the open source uh, tools? It's like Sunshine or something like that. That's news to me. Okay, to know about okay, I, I'm I'm I might be saying totally the wrong thing right now, but I know there's a group that's working on tools to help make um, sharing data uh, more feasible. Paul would know more about that. Okay, yeah. So, so sorry for the tangent here. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much for taking the time right. to sit down with me. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Mike.